And welcome to uh, today's edition of COVID Conversations from the University of Oxford, a fantastic series that the university has been running over the last couple of weeks to pull together um, uh, assorted and amazing expertise from around the university um, and how uh, some of our research and insights are contributing to the response to COVID and, uh, and really looking at how the world is, is changing. Uh, really excited to be a part of it today. My name is Peter Drobak. I'm the director of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship, which is at uh, Said Business School here in, in Oxford. Um, and we really exist to drive entrepreneurial solutions to the world's most pressing problems. Uh, my background is actually as an academic global health person and an infectious disease medic. So for many years, I worked to build and study health systems around the world um, from uh, big cities in America to uh, uh, to, to rural areas and really poor countries and uh, had been involved with uh, all kinds of epidemic infectious diseases um, over, over the years and have been certainly engaging around the, the current pandemic. And really pleased to be joined today by a, a longtime PAL colleague and co-conspirator, Dr. Aoife Haney. Hi everyone, my name is Aoife Brophy Haney and I'm a lecturer in innovation and enterprise I'm based at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment and the Side Business School in Oxford. So I'm in a joint uh, appointment between the two places. And um, my research is really all about um, innovation and collaboration for sustainable development. I've done a lot of work, particularly looking at um, the need for innovation um, for energy transitions and moving towards um, net zero carbon. Um, and um, we'll bring some of those, those insights into the, into the conversation that we're going to have today. Um, what we're going to do today is to actually reflect on um, this opportunity that we have to rebuild um, post-COVID in ways that can actually address um, some of the underlying systemic problems that we're facing in, in society, particularly the climate emergency. And um, and I have been learning a lot from each other, um, discussing these things over the last um, couple of months. Um, we wrote an op-ed for the Independent um, in early May, setting out some of our early thinking about these connections between um, COVID-19 and, and the climate crisis. And today we really want to go a little bit deeper. Um, so we want to bring some of these insights um, together for you in conversation. Um, so we'll make this a uh, conversational um, 15 minutes or so. Um, we're gonna touch on lots of different themes. Um, and as we go along, um, we'll refer to some several pieces of research um, that um, particularly from the Smith School and the links to all the papers that we'll mention are just under the under the video. Um, so I'm just going to hand back over to Peter to talk us through um, the logistics. Yeah, so if you're watching live, uh, we want to hear from you. Um, we'll do about 15 minutes of conversation and then save the last 10, 15 minutes um, for uh, you know answering your questions. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can answer questions right into the chat. If you're watching on any other platform, just send us a tweet um, uh, and just tweet to the at uni of Oxford uh, Twitter handle, um, or you can email covid.conversations at admin.ox.ac.u. UK. Uh, any one of those ways to get a question to us as they come up, we'll try to answer as many as we can um, as uh, uh, when we get to that a little bit later. Um, so with that, let's uh, let's kick off, Eva. Great. Um, so, Peter, I think a good place to start, actually, before we talk about changing and rebuilding systems post-COVID, is to step back and to unpack what the COVID-19 pandemic has actually taught us so far. Um, and you've been doing a lot of thinking about this and commentating on many different aspects of, of the pandemic um, for the past few months now. So I'd love to hear your thoughts um, to start us off on what you think we've actually learned about our economic and social systems during, during this time. Thanks, Aoife. So we're about six months into this pandemic now, right? This is a virus that to our knowledge didn't exist in humans until perhaps early December. And we look at the speed and scale and breadth with which it's really wrought um, suffering and um, uh, in, in damage across the world. It's really, it's really staggering, right? We're um, at uh, now several million infections and hundreds of thousands of deaths. And, um, uh, and we're still in the early phases of the pandemic, unfortunately, where even though in some places they seem to have gotten ahead of things a little bit and are starting to recover here in the UK, we're, we're, we're still struggling and uh, in, in across the world in many parts um, like Latin America, some parts of South Asia, we're actually just seeing signs of acceleration. So globally, the pandemic is actually still picking up speed um, and, and we have a 
long ways to go. Now, a lot of us who work in public health and infectious diseases have for many, many years been saying that, you know, the big one, the big kind of um, uh, new infectious disease pandemic is a matter of when, not if. We didn't know what the pathogen was going to be or where it would come from or exactly how it would spread. Uh, but, you know, we've seen more and more and more um, emerging infectious diseases like this in recent years. And the reasons for that are climate change, which changes the patterns of vectors, globalization, which makes it possible for a person with an infection um, in one city to get um, halfway around the world in 12 hours and spread that somewhere else. Um, and then also kind of population growth and urbanization because density of people, of course, fosters spread. And that's why even if you look at over like the last 20 years, we've seen, uh, you know, SARS and MERS and H1N1, several outbreaks of Ebola. So many sort of epidemic infectious diseases. And, you know, you have to start a pandemic only because a pandemic when it's an outbreak or an epidemic that sort of lose we lose control of or that we don't manage well. What I think is important um, as we reflect on this is first off how unprepared we were um, for this and that even our public health systems, um, at least in some parts of the world, particularly wealthy countries, really were not prepared um, to, um, to respond to this quickly and to kind of extinguish the fires when they were, were still small. And of course, we're paying the price for that. Um, but what we've also seen is that, you know, it's revealed so much fragility in many of our other systems. And, you know, the systems that allow us to kind of live and work and prosper, hopefully as we do, are many times invisible to us. We take them for granted until something goes wrong. An example would be if you think about going to the supermarket to do some panic buying in February or early March and starting to see empty shelves, something that a lot of us have never experienced before, you take for granted the supply chains that are bringing food um, from distant places, um, you know, right to your doorstep until, until you, you need them. And so the Big trends are that you know globalization, the thing that's created so much prosperity for so many in, in many years, as Ian Golden says, it can be a super spreader of good, is also a super spreader of harm in the sense of kind of these pandemics. And it's created a level of interdependence and interconnectedness that is super efficient but also creates real fragility. The big sort of pain point for us as a society is that we all tend to be very reactive um, to the problem that's in front of us. We're putting out the fire at hand and it's very difficult for us to look at the long term and to look beneath the surface at the systems that are actually driving things. That's the kind of thinking that we need around, uh, around climate, for example. So what we've been talking about a lot is to start to treat the system, not the symptoms. So to look deeper under the surface to look longer term. And that's something, Aoife, of course, that you and I teach about at, um, at Site Business School in the GoTo program, where we choose a sustainable development goal or a big wicked problem every year that students kind of dig into. And in fact, we did climate action this year. So one way to think about the pandemic in the big picture is that this is a dress rehearsal for a 21st century problems, big, messy, interconnected problems that transcend an organization or a country for which we all need to work together in a concerted effort. And so if we get this right, hopefully it can give us a kind of a playbook for collective action that can help us solve even larger threats like, uh, like the climate crisis. Um, and, and so if I wonder if, uh, if you can reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd, I'd love to pick up, up on some of the things that, you, that you've just mentioned, particularly these interconnections. Um, and, and as you said, I mean, this dress rehearsal kind of nature of the crisis that we're currently experiencing um, and the ripple effects that, that you know, the, the crisis, it started as a public health crisis, but it is, has morphed into so much more than that and affected so many different um, systems. So, I mean, we've been thinking a lot about this um, because we started the year off teaching the MBAs um, in January, and it seems like in January that climate was going to be completely dominating the headlines. Um, and you know, we we were really emphasizing this point to the MBAs that this is the beginning of a decade of of climate action. Um, we were gearing up for um, COP twenty six, the UN climate summit in Glasgow. Um, and of course, that's now been postponed um, as a result of the um, of the pandemic. Um, and and I think so. I, I I think the current kind of crisis um, resulting from from COVID nineteen 
has certainly kind of has this element of kind of dress rehearsal, but it also is this critical moment um, for us to kind of find ways to actually come out of the, the crisis and to recover in ways that allow us to address um, these other systemic problems that, that you mentioned. Um, so I think there's been a lot of um, attention in, in the news and the media to date about the short-term effects of um, the pandemic on, um, on carbon emissions, um, on the climate. So the International Energy Agency predicts um, an 8% drop in, um, in carbon emissions this year. Um, but the, the, the really kind of big thing to focus on here is we would actually need to see that kind of size of reduction year on year if we're going to be keeping to um, the targets that have been set in the, in the Paris Agreement. So to try to kind of keep um, global temperature increases um, to, to less than two degrees. Um, and the other kind of really critical thing here is that that has come at the expense of shutting off economic activity, right? So we've shut down kind of big parts of, um, of economies in order to be able to, um, to have those, um, those types of carbon reductions. And that's created immense hardship um, around the world. Um, and so for me, when, when I'm thinking about this connection between kind of the, um, the pandemic and, and climate, I think it's really important that we are clear that in order to address the climate crisis, we don't actually, we don't need to shut off economic activity. And we need to kind of make sure that that's a very clear part of um, the narrative going forward about recovery from, um, from COVID, because I think this gives us this incredible opportunity to say, okay, um, we have had things shut down. We've experienced, you know, what it's like to kind of breathe clean air in our cities. And that kind of stays um, with us to, to a certain extent, hopefully. But more than that, it gives us this moment to actually fundamentally change um, many things about, about what, we, what we do going forward. Um, and, and in a way that can address not just the climate crisis, but also other systemic problems. Um, what, do I, what do I really mean by that? I mean, it's, it's one thing to say that, you know, these things are all interconnected and we have this big kind of moment of opportunity. Um, so right now, the reason that I think it's this very important moment and lots of people um, are calling for this to be used as a, a moment of opportunity, um, lots of governments are starting to mobilize huge amount of spending for, um, for long-term recovery. Um, and um, um, critically to focus obviously on the on recovering from the pandemic. Um, but um, the research that we've been doing at the Smith School, so my colleagues um, Cameron Hepburn and Brian O'Callaghan, um, they've led a new piece of work um, based on surveys of over 200 uh, leading economists and economic officials. Um, and they suggest um, that spending the money that governments are going to be spending anyway, spending it on climate friendly green policies um, is good for the climate and it's good for the economy. Um, and the examples of the types of policies that will actually kind of deliver those, um, those benefits. Um, so if we put money into investing in green construction projects, for example, so um, building retrofits to make sure that we have insulation in homes um, and uh, new heating technologies, if we invest in clean energy infrastructure, they have long-term benefits obviously for the climate and we've been talking about them for, for many years, but they also have short-term benefits and they, they give people jobs, they're labor intensive, um, they're labor intensive um, uh, investment areas. They, they create um, and generate jobs at a time when, when unemployment rates are, are very high. Um, and, um, and so we have this kind of combination of the, the short-term and long-term benefits from, from really focusing on these types of policies um, in order to kind of to reboot economies. And then the other kind of main message um, coming out of, of this work from, from Cameron and, and Brian and others is that these policies can also be addressed, designed in ways that can address um, other underlying problems such as um, poverty and inequality. So for example, if we think about um, investment priorities for, um, for uh, countries in um, the global south, um, it makes a lot of sense to be investing in supporting rural electrification and development um, because um, this kind of um, gives a pathway out of poverty for um, for many different um, for many different people. Um, it doesn't just provide access to electricity. Um, it can also provide a way for um, farmers um, through um, having better access to, to irrigation technologies, um, electrified irrigation to increase their crop yields, and so that gives a pathway kind of out of poverty. Um, it also creates um, jobs, of course, in, um, in the electrification um, industry um, itself. 
Um, and we're seeing um, through um, a lot of the conversations that we're having in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa um, related to, to off-grid energy, for example, um, is that businesses are really kind of ready for, um, for taking advantage of this opportunity and for thinking more broadly about what they can do next in order to, yes, address climate, but um, also provide um, jobs, um, provide um, rural development opportunities for, for people, and provide um, electrified healthcare opportunities as well. So that's one of the things that the pandemic has really um, made very visible in, in the global south is that um, if we don't have electrified healthcare, um, then it's very difficult to provide um, ventilators for, for people who are suffering from, um, from COVID-19, for example. So it comes back to this visibility that you mentioned as well, that I think we've, um, we've seen this exposure of fr fragility in the systems um, and, and a visibility brought to um, things that, that have been um, very invisible um, or at least less visible to, to some of us than, um, than, than they might have been otherwise. So in, in summary, I think it's this really big opportunity for policies during recovery to be good for, for the climate and for the economy, but also to address some of these underlying inequalities that, that we see um, that, that, that really pervade um, many different systems that we rely on. And I'd, I'd really love for you actually to pick up on this kind of theme of inequality, Peter, because I know you've been doing a lot of thinking about this and obviously we've seen a big change um, with um, the, the recent um, focus um, and, and mobilization on the streets for, for Black Lives Matter. And um, there's lots of um, diff different effects of the pandemic on different communities. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we can learn about, um, about inequality from, from what we're experiencing at the moment. Yeah, and I think this issue is so, so big and important. And another one of these things that has really been expose a kind of pervasive and insidious and if you're living on the wrong side of inequality of course experiencing harm from it it's something you live with every day but then to many others in, in, in privilege it's something that has been invisible so of course all the mobilization that we've seen in, in you know in the streets and in communities across the world in response to the you know assassination and, and lynching of, of, of George Floyd um, and, and many others is largely geared around responding to this kind of epidemic of, of police brutality but of course it goes Goes much deeper to um, to what's really been a pandemic of um, of systemic racism and inequality that um, actually cuts across all different aspects of our society. And so even before this, um, this all kind of um, really uh, you know, rose to the top of everyone's minds over the last couple of weeks, given recent events, there was already emerging evidence that with COVID-19, something that early on people would call the great equalizer because it's going to rich countries and poor countries mm -hmm. and everyone can be infected. In fact, it's not, right? That we've seen a disproportionate burden on communities of color in particular, suffering higher rates of infection, higher Higher rates of hospitalization, higher rates of death, sometimes two to four times higher than their white counterparts in the same communities. The reasons for that are not biological, right? The virus doesn't discriminate, but we uh, as a society really do. And, uh, and, and so this is so important because it's not only affecting our response to the pandemic, <laughs> But this is cross-cutting and it's deep and it's been present for, um, you know, for, for decades or centuries. And it's something that we're going to need to reckon with if we're going to make progress on the pandemic. But it cuts across, again, all of these, these issues. So even if you think about climate action, um, the, the impacts of climates that we're seeing already are not... Um, felt equally by all countries and all communities around the world. Uh, the, the negative impacts are disproportionately affecting uh, poor countries, for example, and particularly those who are already living on the margins. And we know the potential for those disparities is only going to increase. So whether it's about responding to this pandemic, whether it's thinking about our climate action agenda, we need to make sure that um, that notions of equity and justice are front and center as, as, as part of our response. Um, Aoife, before we get to questions, um, if you can pick up on that a little bit, we talked about how the pandemic is a dress rehearsal for climate change and other big 21st century problems, right? We've seen, unfortunately, a lot of the COVID response has been really very nationalistic, right? That borders are being closed and maybe temporarily that needs to be done. Um, and that we've looked a lot at what this country is doing, that country is doing. We've not seen enough of kind of the, the global solidarity and cooperation that we need to solve a problem that doesn't mm -hmm. respect borders. Um, 
Um, can you talk about what kind of collaboration we need to address world scale problems like this and what's gonna be needed for, um, uh, for climate action? Absolutely. So I'll just touch briefly on some of the work that we've been doing recently. Um, so with my colleagues, um, Theo Kojianu and Alette Mering, um, we've just um, come out with a working paper that's, um, that's under the video, um, looking at some of the collaborations that have been emerging, the strategic alliances that have been announced um, in response to COVID-19. Um, so we wanted to kind of get a sense of um, what actually, what types of collaborations are um, especially companies driving in response to, um, to the pandemic. Um, so we look at over 200 of these alliances um, between in the first four months of this year, and we're continuing to, to, to monitor these um, alliances over time, um, because I think it comes back to this dress rehearsal notion again. Um, I think it, it, it's almost the, the, these rapid experiments in the types of collaborations that are emerging. Um, we, can, we can learn so much about them um, from them for, for other um, global challenges, including climate. And I think just to pick up on a couple of um, things that we're seeing, and we're seeing a rapid emergence of, of different types of alliances um, that have started with this immediate focus on the problem, um, the core kind of problems of treating kind of the symptoms um, associated with the pandemic, right? Um, and then we've seen this expansion to alliances that are actually kind of looking at um, the complementary equipment that's necessary to, um, to, to, to manage the pandemic um, and the infrastructure that's required and um, to be able to make sure that people are um, taken care of in a, in, a, in a longer term way. So alliances for modular medical units and um, alliances between, um, between different um, companies to, um, to deal with shortages in medical equipment and testing and tracking um, software, for example. And then I think most recently we're seeing um, a lot of alliances that are trying to address the underlying impacts. And um, so these inequalities, um, so the vulnerable communities, how they're affected by the pandemic. Um, so we see this kind of expansion of these alliances, but the ones that are really tackling these underlying um, um, underlying dimensions are, are only just starting to emerge. Um, and I think what we can learn from that um, for um, climate is um, that we have this opportunity now to learn from these examples. So there's lots of really interesting examples of competitors um, working together. Um, Google and Apple, for example, they have a, an alliance on contact tracing. Um, different industries are starting to work together. So Ford, the automaker, is involved in lots of different alliances to, to use their manufacturing knowledge um, to accelerate the assembly of different types of um, equipment. Um, so face masks and, um, and um, ventilators, for example. So we can learn a lot about um, these um, unusual kinds of partnerships because those are going to be required a lot more um, in dealing with climate. And they're critical to be able to shift um, energy systems, food systems. Um, but what we're seeing um, is that these, at the moment, these um, collaborations are being driven so quickly because they're connected to people and they're connected to people's needs. Um, I think that's something that we can take away for um, thinking about climate. Um, we need to be stepping back um, and, and governments need to help us in stepping back um, and thinking about what kinds of services people actually need. What kinds of cities do we actually want to, to live in? Um, and I think that's a, a critical role for, for policymakers to um, support um, the, the role of the private sector in engaging in, um, in climate action in the future. And it goes back to what we were talking about, this opportunity to, um, to actually use um, the, the moment that we have now um, to, um, to really um, develop policies that enable a recovery um, that is, is good for the economy and, and good for the climate and good for people as well in addressing kind of inequalities um, that are deeply um, embedded in systems. So there's lots of work to do, um, but I think lots of inspiration as well um, from this um, dress rehearsal. I think we need to take as much as we can um, from um, learning about these rapid experimentations that we're seeing um, in, in collaboration and in collective action and really um, bring that forward in, in how we think about um, rebuilding um, post COVID. Thanks, Eva. Let's turn to questions. We got a lot of great questions. Um, I'll try to combine a few so we can get to several of them within the time that we have left. And I'm sorry that I don't have the names of the questions that came through because it's all getting filtered into our, our Zoom here. Um, so forgive me for that. Um, Aoife, the first one is for you. I'm actually maybe combine two related questions. Um, how do we convince people who are skeptical that shifts to a green economy is actually helpful for the economy and not a threat? 
Another way of framing that from, uh, um, from another viewer is if we weren't making progress on switching to a green economy before, why would we now? I think that's where this critical point about the short-term benefits of doing this are very important to emphasize. Um, so we need to create jobs for people um, across the world. Um, that's a huge concern coming out of the, uh, out of the um, pandemic. And um, I think that's where we need to be kind of framing um, the, the conversation around um, recovery. It's not just about climate, it's about, um, it's about many of the other things that we've been, been talking about, actually. Um, it's about kind of making sure that we're um, bringing people along with us as well. And I think that's something that we haven't done a good enough job of in, in, um, in preparing ourselves for, um, for climate action um, to date. Um, and I think there's much more of an emphasis that on that now in the climate movement that it's, um, as Peter mentioned, I mean, we need to, we need to be focused on equity. It's not, um, it's not only about um, climate and the economy, it has to be about um, the people who are affected. And I think that's an incredibly powerful um, lever um, to be able to make sure that, and that, we, can, um, that we can use this moment um, to, to leverage um, change in, in, in many different systems. Yeah, it feels different. I think you know if you think about the level of mobilization, um, mm -hmm. sort of leading up to early 2020 that we saw around the world, particularly in the youth movement. Uh, if you think about some of the um, uh, the ways that we're seeing the impacts in much more direct and tangible ways, it makes climate change feel much more immediate than it did mm -hmm. perhaps before. Um, and then maybe some of these kinds of tipping points in terms of sort of cost benefit, at least in ways that are more visible. Now that's why I thought that that um, the the piece you mentioned by um, Cameron Hepburn and Joe Stiglitz and others was so powerful because if we're really getting to a place where um, it actually creates more jobs um, and more economic benefit to do the right thing, and you've got all those incentives aligned, when you get right down to it, it's always about the money. Unfortunately, that's just the way the world um, too often works. And so that shift could be also a really powerful catalyst. All those forces kind of moving together might lead to a tipping point. And what I hope will happen, we need to happen, is that the way large scale change happens is often very, 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 very slow, and then it's fast. Um, and that's the kind of the, the kind of shift we're going to need to see. Um, next question, and maybe I'll again combine a few um, here. Um, they're, they're, they're flowing in. Um, are parallels with wartime helpful, like social programs launched um, after World War II? Um, and then kind of related to that, is COVID going to fundamentally challenge the broken capitalist economic systems across the world. Um, to an extent, yes. Sometimes I get tired of um, uh, wartime metaphors and you know, bringing sort of violent images into sort of everything we have to do. But if you think about the kinds of disruption that this has caused um, uh, in the scale of kind of suffering, dislocation, et cetera, you probably have to go back to World War II to find anything that's comparable um, in terms of breadth and, and, and scale and depth. And in that sense, I think, yes, it's worth, I think it's really worth thinking about the, the kind of recovery and, and investment that's gonna be made, made to rebuild societies and economies whenever this pandemic cools down is gonna be massive. And what we need, we're gonna need a Marshall Plan of some sort, and we're gonna need a green Marshall Plan ideally to do that. So, um, so I think it's really important to think about how those kinds of large scale investments can actually build for the future. And it is an opportunity that you don't get every day um, to think about how you can fundamentally transform systems. Um, so there is an opportunity that requires obviously real leadership. Um, and that's something that is lacking um, in, in some countries right now. And of course, that's a concern. The other thing that I think that you maybe take away from World War II is, you know, after World War II came Bretton Woods and the creation of a lot of the big um, international or multi multilateral institutions of global governance. And we've seen both how important they are and how they're not really fit for purpose in the 21st century. And, um, uh, you know, this is all in the context of rising nationalism and other kinds of things, but in a perfect world, this is a, a moment where we really need to think about global governance systems and what it's going to take for allow us to work in a way that's going to be more coordinated in the future because all of the big problems we're going to face in this century are going to be um, are going to be supranational in, in in some way shape or form. Aoife anything you want to add to that? Yeah I mean the main thing I would add is um, that I think it um, 
it is kind of helpful to think about um, post-World War, War II in the sense that the role of government is just so critical right now. Um, and this, this role of government leadership, I think, is, is really important. Um, but I think it also kind of gives this opportunity to, um, to think a bit differently about the, the interaction between um, government and the private sector. Um, and, um, and I think that kind of picks up on your second kind of point, um, Peter. So we need to kind of, we need to be developing much more links between um, the public and private kind of um, institutions that we have. Um, and this um, coordination globally needs to, to combine kind of very many different types of organizations in ways that we haven't really seen um, in, in the past. Um, so I think while we can definitely learn a lot from um, the, the increased need for, um, for government um, um, leadership and direction, um, I think we, we need new ways of, of thinking about um, um, enabling um, innovation from, from the private sector and um, in, in collaboration with, with civil society as well. I think that's where, um, yeah, where things are, are, um, are slightly different. Yeah, um, the question, thank you, Aoife. The questions keep pouring in, but unfortunately, yeah, it's a short time. In. It was a webinar for only 30 minutes. I could stay here all day. Um, one last question, Aoife, you can take first and then I'll close with, um, are you optimistic about the future? Today, <laughs> I today I am optimistic about the future. Um, I really, I, I really believe that this is one of these critical moments for us to leverage. Um, and um, that we have been preparing for this. And um, so it kind of goes back to the, the first question that, um, that we were posed um, from, from the audience. Um, so I think we've got many different things that have been um, working towards um, dealing with, with climate action um, in a more accelerated way. Um, and the pandemic has almost kind of done the climate kind of movement a, a favor by um, you know, pointing to other ways that we can actually think about accelerating um, change in systems. Um, and so um, I think this, um, this combination um, really um, holds quite a lot of promise. We've seen you know, huge decrease in costs in um, different technologies over the last um, decade. Um, renewable energy technologies, for example, um, were on the cusp of being able to integrate different technologies together in ways that will fundamentally change um, the way we live in, in cities, the way we work. Um, and those kinds of ideas about living in cities and working are actually, um, we're being helped along through, you know, a lot of hardship um, at the moment in, in dealing with the pandemic, of course, and I don't want to um, underestimate the, the hardship, but it also gives us this opportunity to think about, okay, well, how do we want to work in the future? Do we all need to kind of be so closely, um, you know, connected in, in our cities? Do we need to be traveling as much? Um, you know, how do we want to kind of set things up in, in, in the future in a way that will um, enable and address a lot of the inequalities that we have in, um, in our systems. And um, so I'm optimistic about the, the fact that I think this um, brings together many different threads that have been um, developing and emerging um, in, the last, um, in the last few decades. Um, and I'm optimistic because I work with um, such incredible people here in Oxford that I think, um, and collaborating with many different institutions around the world, um, where we can um, we can mobilize um, collaborations between and convene um, policymakers and business and civil society in ways that can fundamentally change um, systems for for the future. Thanks. Um, on my How about side, you? How are you feeling? Um, you know, I'm um, I'm scared. I'm mm -hmm. angry. I'm frustrated. I'm tired. And I'm optimistic. Um, my my one of my old mentors, Jim Kim, who um, co-founded Partners in Health, where I worked for a long time, and then ran the World Bank, um, uh, likes to say that optimism is a moral choice. Um, so much hangs in the balance right now, right? There's all this opportunity that we're talking about that could be so great. Um, things could easily swing the other direction, right? The tides of rising nationalism, 
division, oppression that we're seeing coming out of the White House and other kinds of places um, is, is very much alive. And you know, through the kinds of challenges that we're facing, you could see this go either way. And I think it's up to all of us to make sure that we're pushing that it goes in the right direction. And so, um, uh, so I choose to be optimistic because it's gonna require all of us to create the kind of change that we need. And that's why even in the midst of a pandemic, um, I'm happy to see people out in the streets right now. And, and one of those people, um, um, and I think it's important because all of these things are connected. So, um, so the answer is um, worried, angry, scared, optimistic. Um, we need to work harder and, and, and push harder to create the kind of future that we all want. Um, so thank you. We're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, because we're out of time or over time, as it were. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, this has been a great series and I wanna highlight, um, particularly if you're new to COVID conversations, um, that next week, the next session is actually gonna be about vaccines for COVID-19. Um, and that's tremendously exciting because as many of you know, um, the, uh, the amazing sort of vaccine scientists here in, in Oxford have been developing and testing one of the kind of leading vaccine candidates right now. And so we're, we're all waiting with bated breath for, for results. Um, and so it'll be great to kind of hear on the get the inside story on what's happening right now because uh, you know we're not going to get anywhere near back to normal until we have a vaccine and so um, it's a conversation you don't want to miss so please do check it out. Um, final plug if you've enjoyed this conversation um, I've been hosting a new podcast called Reimagine um, uh, out of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship. We approach problems in the same kind of way it's about social innovation and how large-scale change happens and how you look in systems um, we talked with Al Gore about climate change, Paul Farmer about the pandemic, um, Kate Rayworth about how we can reform our economic systems. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, so I encourage you to check it out. Okay, Aoife, you're awesome. It's always fun to be together with you. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Peter. And thank you, everybody, for, for watching and for all the great questions. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. Tune in again, and uh, we'll see you again.